Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. If our foods don't exist, then we essentially don't as a people. That our genetic makeup, everything about us, is all developed off of these foods. We were put on, gathered up, put on reservations, and expected to eat commodity food and become ranchers. Without that keystone piece, how does a person understand their identity or who they are? It's about ancestral memory and um, the depth of that and the value of that as a healing mechanism. Any one of these indigenous plants is good for something. They're way more than just commodities. They are our greatest teachers, our most powerful teachers, and we organize our lives around them. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. We're living in a world with 7.6 billion people on it who are all eating food on a just-in-time resource base. We've got to produce the calories to avoid mass starvation. and the population's growing. It's, it's expected to go up to nine billion people. One of the problems with our modern diet in American culture is that it's very high in sugar, fat, and calories. And what we have begun to realize through genetic testing is that we call it epigenetics, but what it means is that certain kinds of diet actually turn genes on and off. And so we have an increase in things like diabetes, heart disease, um, cancers, a variety of different cancers. The golden brick. Commodity foods high in fats, carbohydrates, and sugars were and are the survival foods of indigenous tribes still today. The government food programs came as a result of broken treaties and the further taking of indigenous lands important for ancestral foods. The problem with government commodities being provided to native peoples is that what you're doing is imposing a food system that is totally alien to the ancestral heritage of the people. Here we have some beef stews. So by providing butter and other products that are not part of the, the regional diet, it actually creates problems in the body of the people. If you take a look, hard look at the, the food that we eat, you know, you can see why there's a high rate of diabetes. You know, why there's a high rate of, um, you know, I guess you could say malnutrition, right? So government food commodities sounds like a wonderful idea because you're feeding people, but the government could do it so much better by feeding them culturally appropriate foods. So it's kind of a, a, a devil's choice between potential starvation and the fact that the food is, is in many cases deadly and deleterious. Now, by going back to local resources, it's a healthier way to live because you get a better balanced diet. Being able to raise foods that are healthy means that you have a personal relationship with the plants and the crops, and there is a sacred feeling when you're raising anything. Anytime that you are tied to the land and the animals, it is a sacred experience. I grew up in like a traditional home, but I was raised by my great-grandparents and they knew where all the plants and um, roots were, but they were physically unable to show me. I was always struck when Columbus first came upon indigenous people. There's many journals that talk about the health of indigenous people. They had like this beautiful skin and their eyesight was, you know, like an eagle. They had amazing hair and, and healthy spines. So I'm always walking this balance and wanting to make sure 
that more harm is not created upon my Indian relatives and friends. Because in white privilege, white is what has power. That is the narrative that most of the world is living. I do the hoop dance just to make people feel good so they could get a spiritual gain. Just growing up knowing that I had another form of prayer that many people do not understand. They think it's just for entertainment, but it's a really old dance that was brought up from the South and it was a form of prayer. I don't see them, but my ancestors are watching me and guiding me along. As a youth growing up on the reservation, it's kind of hard. We have our own difficulties. And then there's the epigenetic, you know, that is about behaviors that are passed on and are carried. You know, they ride, they ride on the DNA, and so, you know, indigenous people end up inheriting all of those traumas. You're out in the heat, you know, you're, you're working your body, you know, you have to be one with the elements, you know, you're sweating, you know, your, your, your blood temperature and your blood pulse is rising. So you're pretty much working your body out while you're gathering food. I would have enjoyed tanning the hides. I don't mind a little hard work. The men hunted and they fished for the food and the women did all the work. They did the cooking, the cleaning, the making of the clothes, the gathering of the food and processing the food, like drying the food. When you look around, you've got mountains to hike, you got rivers to fish. You know, our people knew all about the medicines, the foods and everything. The foods are here, the medicines are here too. You know, so now people are realizing we had it right all along. They just wouldn't believe us. We're, we're so used to just opening up hop and we don't appreciate water and everything around us. Like this is an important plant that I barely know about, a sago lily, so. And we could make good food and stuff that lasts for a long time, so. People my age are dying younger and younger and just seeing the health-wise, like this is how us Indians used to eat and how we used to live. So it's really important to know our plants and heal, that it heals us. So that's how I look at it. Right now in the day and age, we don't really think about, you know, what plants are edible. Fresh fruits and vegetables are good, you know, because a long time ago we were planted that too. We were a lot more healthier because we were outdoors, picking fruits, picking vegetables, gardening. A lot of the plants, they're edible and they are pretty. Yeah. So it's really important to have that connection to the earth as we move forward as humans, to be a lot more resourceful with all of this beautiful life that's around us, um, and to be less wasteful because we really feel like indigenous education was something that was wiped off the map um, through the assimilation efforts in the boarding schools and residential schools. Before we pick, we, um, we practice our um, spiritual belief, which is to say a prayer and to let the earth know that we're only here to visit and that we're not gonna pick more than what, we, um, what we're supposed to. The work is hard. It's, it's a lot like um, farm work or like hardcore extreme gardening, but it's rewarding too. It should be important for all of us. When my grandmother was teaching me how to make fry bread using her recipe, I wasn't aware at that time she was taking me into her past experiences. She was showing me the times in her life where survival was learning how to cook food that the native people had adopted as their own. The ingredients to make fry bread didn't exist on this land before contact. It was, you know, given to us through a commodity food package. And our innovative ancestors made something really delicious happen out of it. 
which is so cool and something to be celebrated. And I'm not anti-fry bread. I just don't classify it as a traditional food. You know, it was a recipe created out of a commodity foods program in the late 1800s, early 1900s, depending on where you're from um, in North America. The government would provide uh, provisions to tribal communities to try to keep people off of their traditionally custom harvesting grounds and hunting grounds. Our ancestors utilized those for foods constantly and they had thousands of generations of knowledge to back them up of how to harvest and when to harvest and which parts to harvest and knowing the value of all the plants nearby us for food, for medicine, for crafting. They're put on small pieces of land that, that really could not sustain their food systems that were also based in cultural language, all of that. When you're lost in the world, the land that you come from knows who you are. It spans across all things and it's all centered around food, which is the way our people have learned for since time began. Now you gotta remember like in the 14, 15, 1600s, we had millions and millions of buffalo. Then pretty soon, they almost became extinct. They were killed off for their hides and their tongues. So what the government did was, they sent out people to kill all the buffalo. And pretty soon, they were almost all gone. But, you know, we survived. You still have people who live here traditionally who necessarily don't have full-time jobs, right? But they still gather, they still hunt. They're some of the most healthiest people around, you know? So, I mean, that's just a good example of what, you know, traditional food sovereignty does for, I guess you could say, indigenous peoples versus the more uh, commercial mechanism of buying food from the store. And then my mom, mostly she dried the meat that way it didn't freeze, you know, if it was in a real cold. So she waited until about a month later, maybe January, February, that's when she'd start taking them out of their bags to cook, to thaw a couple of days and then cook, cook them later. Then they had their ways. My mom's favorite was antelope. My dad was deer. And every morning, you know, growing up, we'd either have pheasant or rabbit or sage chicken, you know, for breakfast. That's all I remember is growing up, you know, we never really had like bacon and sausage and stuff like we have now. It was always wild game. Whatever my dad killed in a field, that was our breakfast, you know. You got to remember this buffalo was the source of, you know, everything that our people needed, they got from the buffalo. When you say buffalo, you say he say non. Everybody say that. He say non. He say non it. It's a buffalo herd. Yeah. He say non it. Try to get tough with it. When you get that food, you know whether you eat it right there, you're taking all the nutrients in, right? And so, whereas if you dry it and you eat it, you know, natural in its natural state, you're getting all those nutrients, right? Some like I mentioned, dried meat, right? We call that, um, you know, pretty much Americans call it jerky, right? That came from native people, right? Because we had a, a an intricate understanding of what happens when you dry meat, when you slice it in thin slices and you hang it out to dry. When you're not cooking it, it still has all of its natural iron, it has its potassium, it has all of its calcium, right? all these things, all the phosphate, right? All the natural plants that the animal consumed is still in the cells, right? Of, of the molecular structure of that meat. That's how our ancestors had dried the meat and that, you know, kept us uh, fed during the winters and, uh, you know, when we had nothing to eat, and, you know, the dry meat was always there. The language culture camp is uh, for our language. It's basically, you know, teach our young ones about the things that we know, especially our elders, and, uh, you know, the process of our, our traditional foods. We need to save it, learn it, keep going. I bring my grandkids because it seems like the younger kids, like the small ones, they, they catch on fast. The little ones could really carry on a sentence. It's like, wow, you need to teach me. <laughs>
But the main purpose of getting rid of the buffalo was to get rid of who? Yes. That was Nitta and that Plains tribes. So they, because they knew our buffalo was the source of our livelihood, meaning that we depended on the buffalo for everything. Food sovereignty is so important for future generations. That they're way more than just commodities. Basanach, no basanach, no. Nishkeha beet, no. Nishkeha beet. Hello. Indigenous food sovereignty, the common connector to health, to language, to culture, through tradition. Food is what has kept us connected and looking for ways to improve life on this planet. Survival is the goal and doing what is necessary to feed your family sometimes means getting food from government assisted programs such as commodities. Corn, peas, you know, all that kind of stuff you can get in the store. And then uh, sugar, it was, I don't remember how that was put, but it was always in papers, paper sacks. My mom and dad had a wagon. They used to take that wagon and go up wherever they were giving out the foods. So that's how we would just get ours. One of the important aspects is, you know, people really have to know how to cook. And so the commodity buildings, sometimes they'll offer off recipes. You know, you can get a recipe and learn how to prepare a meal. You know, I try to work with people to ask them to get rid of the, the fryers and get rid of the junk food because they're just making people sicker. And it's like swimming upstream. Do you think the commodity foods play any, I guess, difference in the health of the Wind River Reservation? Well, I probably can say for my own experience, yes, it's not, I get it, but um, a lot of that stuff is not good, but what else are we going to eat if we don't have the finances to buy good food? The good thing that is that they do is they have fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, when they ha can get it. It's about feeding your family feeding your family and making sure they make it to, you know, the end of the month, sustain them and make sure everybody's happy. You know, they've gotten better, but unfortunately we still have a lot of data of how much damage has been done of people surviving off of commodity foods. We are basically what we eat, you know, so if we're not eating healthy foods, we're going to be unhealthy by nature, you know, because the elk doesn't get to choose what he wants. Now that it is the eagle, you know, they have a certain set of things that they live by, and that's how we used to live. We really have had to sort of put a broken pot back together because so much of our history has been removed uh, by genocide and the forced assimilation processes that happen all over, all over, especially the United States and Canada. I'm looking forward to that. I'm hoping the people, I mean, more people get involved in it and start eating the foods, we're going to see a decrease in diabetes. You know, uh, with the changes in the supply of food and that, and, and the economic way of the way things are going now, it's such a chaos that now I think, you know, see if we do this and we teach our people, we teach our children, and you know, we take what we want and put the time toward it, you know, we got our foods right here in our, in our land. It's kind of, I could, I'm glad they're out here doing it because it's hard work's hard to do nowadays and it's hard to get kids off the TV and out here doing something good for the people, for ourselves, because I know it's persistence and dedication, but something that makes healthy living, I, I like it, so it feels good out here. It's hard on us, the ones that are a little bit older, but the younger kids, they can get with it, but the old, us older ones, it's kind of challenging. If we want to get back to those types of lifestyles, if we want our children to work hard, we need to focus on that age gap. The technology is actually taking over our children where they're not wanting, they're not interested. They're not interested in doing anything like this. They, they'd rather be at home on their games, their phone. That age group, you have to focus on them and educate them and inform them on that type of lifestyle. That contributes to the alcohol abuse, the drug addiction abuse, you know, um, all the way up to, you know, mental disorders. You know, and, and, and part of that is what we eat. We are basically what we eat. 
Every single plant that is edible in tribal communities is good for something, and generally it's good for your physical health. From my perspective, it's been um, really healing for ancestral trauma and specifically uh, mental health issues. And every time we lose an elder, we lose that incredible wisdom. So we're really trying to help empower people by bringing back a sense of our Native American foods and how we can access them. So, in the way of the Shoshone, I want to apologize for speaking in front of those who know and carry more knowledge than I do. The settler colonizer wanted them dead, all of them dead. And when they realized it cost too much money to kill all Indians, then they went into assimilation projects, and that's when boarding schools were um, created to assimilate, you know, the Indian. If you teach Native Americans to be individualistic in nature, you'll, you'll ruin the communal aspect of sharing, right? And that's what our people did. We shared with everything. You know, the history obviously brings up a lot of emotion. I think when we understand the past a little bit more, we understand the people that are around us more. I mean, if I get to know my neighbor and their stories, I learn more about them and what what their struggles have been and you end up I think you develop more empathy for people when you when you understand them more. For so long we've been represented in history as um, sort of like a burden or something that's in the way but in fact tribes are in really great positions to be um, wonderful amplifiers and catalysts of e economies of environmental policy that serves everybody at this time. In the 1700s, it was considered wrong to think that people could govern themselves. You had to have a monarchy to govern people. One of the, the letters of Thomas Jefferson, he said, our native peoples ought to long ago have disproven this notion that you cannot govern yourselves through democracy. He was speaking about the Iroquois Confederacy at the time, where everyone had the right to vote, and they could not only manage their own government perfectly well, but they were more powerful than anyone in the United States at the time. Their governance was based on deep egalitarian democracy. And, and this is, you know, this is not every tribe across the board, most tribes. Um, so every person in the tribe had a voice of equal value. And generally it was, um, decisions were only made by consensus. Peacekeeping and peacemaking in right relationship was really, really important. Depending upon the tribe, they had complex systems of incredible land management. And those right relationships are also when we talk about plants, because those were some of our most important relationships. So how we interacted with the plants and how we were respectful to the plants. You know, there was reciprocity. You, you didn't take more than helping the plant grow and helping the plant survive. This is just getting back in touch with nature um, and really understanding our environments and our ecosystems and how well our ancestors took care of the land, knowing that they were a part of the ecosystem um, and how much damage has been done in a very short time period in what is today the U.S. and Canada and most, most places around the world um, because of how much natural resource was pulled out for capital gain um, without um, thinking about the effects, the after effects of damaging so much in such a fast time. We can be great models for uh, reshaping what microeconomics looks like on a macro scale. You know, I mean, there's incredible opportunity to partner with tribes. And partnering meaning come to us because we have answers. 
So getting back to a, a better sense of how nature works and how plants work and how the earth and the environments work and how in indigenous communities have always been stewards of the land and being able to utilize those practices to harvest things sustainably, knowing um, how to seed, you know, working with not only agricultural um, uh, ways but also a lot of permaculture ways and really helping the environment to really flourish for food to be able to grow enough to sustain large populations. I feel, you know, a deep uh, connection and love to both reservation-based um, tribal members and people who are dwelling in urban settings. And I understand it's difficult for both sides to um, have access to good quality food and good quality health care and education, which turns out to be the three pillars of what we traded land for. Now that my grandmother is no longer here, I carry her in my memories. She is the nature I see everywhere. We were government before there was a government here. You know, and that government, and that way of life did not have poor people. It did not have socioeconomic indiversity. It did not have drug and alcohol addiction. It did not have mass incarceration. You know, so that, that's our way of life versus the American way of life, and that's why we still live and honor that. When the white people first came over, we were told that we can't act the way we are, and now we're giving a chance to act the way we should have been, and it's really hard because we lost so many knowledge and cultural connections. And food plays an intricate role in that. So does the buffalo, so does the eagle, so does the bear. So does the moose, so does the snake, the lizard, the turtle. Those things all play a role in that because they are what we are supposed to be paying attention to and living with rather than dominating and destroying their habitats. Because once we lose all the animals, that ecosystem won't be here no more. This episode of Farm to Fork Wyoming is available. Order online at shop.wyomingpbs.org. This program was produced by Wyoming PBS, which is solely responsible for its content.